In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. My dear friends in Christ, it is certainly beneficial and advisable for us at least once a year to make a retreat, even if it be as we are doing just for one day, that we might think more deeply of the things that pertain to our soul, the importance of the salvation of our soul, the importance of living a good Catholic life, and so forth. I don't recall which prophet from the Old Testament said this, but he said something to the effect, with desolation is all the land made desolate because there is no one that considers in the heart. In other words, there's People don't think deeply. We hear on Sundays the truths of our faith, but to what degree do they really sink in? And to what degree does this listening to the Word of God have an effect in our souls, make a change? Two weeks ago, on Sexagesima Sunday, we had that gospel of the sower who sows the seed in the field. And it's interesting in that parable of our Lord that some of the seed doesn't germinate at all. It ends up falling on the wayside where people walk and the ground is just packed and too hard. Or it falls among the rocks. Or maybe it falls where there are thorns and thistles and maybe it grows up to begin with, but then it's choked out. But other seed that falls on good ground produces 30-fold, 60-fold, even 100-fold. And so we should think to ourselves, what to what degree does the word of God that I hear, that I read in the epistles and gospels, that I hear on Sundays in the sermons, to what does it, to what degree does it germinate and produce fruit in my soul? We have all seen and met individuals who are converted maybe from the Novus Ordo Church, or maybe even from not having been a Catholic at all, never baptized, etc., in a false church or nothing, and converted, and they just embrace the faith so much that they make progress by leaps and bounds. And we think of them and we think, well, here I am, straggling way behind, and here's this person who is new to the faith and is making so much more progress than I am. So we want to be like the seed that germinates and produces a hundredfold. And part of that is reflection and meditation. So often we lose the benefit, let's say, of the sermon on Sunday because we go out and we begin to talk and we get busy and we forget about it. And we don't spend enough time thinking, considering about the truths of our faith. So that is what we want to do during the retreat, and that is why the spirit of silence, of reflection, is so valuable, so important. I would like to have a sort of theme for this day of recollection, and we are scheduled to have three spiritual conferences, and so I decided what could be better. Looking for three themes, than to speak about the Holy Family, Jesus Mary and Joseph. And so this first lecture will be on Jesus, and then on Our Lady, and then on St. Joseph. We have the Feast of the Holy Family every year on the Sunday following the Epiphany. And it is a wonderful reminder of the example of the members of the Holy Family and of the fact that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, coming into this world to redeem us, chose to be born into and live in a family, the Holy Family. And so we look to the three members of that Holy Family as models, as guides, as examples for how we should live. So let us in this first lecture reflect a little bit on our Lord. So the first question, who is Jesus Christ? And we could give many different answers, all of which would add more and more information to our knowledge of our Lord. But put simply, Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the second person 
of the Holy Trinity who became man in order to suffer and die for our redemption. And when we say he became man, we mean that at the Annunciation, when the angel Gabriel appeared to our Blessed Mother to tell her she had been chosen to be the mother of the Redeemer, and then she said those tremendous words, be it done unto me according to thy word, fiat mihi secundum verbum tuum, that fiat brought down from heaven the second person of the Holy Trinity into her womb, and he was united to a human nature. So Jesus Christ then is one person with two natures, the divine and the human. And we know that Jesus is God. We know that he is divine. As the evangelist said, no one needed to tell our Lord what was in man because he knew. He knew what people were thinking. He knew everything. And he could do everything. The, the tremendous cures and miracles, etc. We know our Lord was God. He was divine. He is divine. But he also had a true human nature. Our Lord was able to suffer. He felt pain and sorrow. When his friend Lazarus died, our Lord wept. Again, when he entered the holy city shortly before his own passion and death, he stopped and looking down on the city, he wept over it. And so we can see here our Lord's human nature. He became fatigued in his journeys, tired, exhausted. He felt compassion on the crowds, it says. So he had these human feelings because he had a human nature. He also had a human will. And his will was perfectly conformed to the divine will. But nevertheless, his human nature shrank from the concept of suffering. In the agony in the garden, he said, Father, if it be possible, let this chalice pass, yet not my will, but thine be done. He only sought to do the will of his heavenly Father, even though his human nature shuddered so much at the thought of the sufferings he was about to endure in his passion that in that agony in the garden, his sweat became as drops of blood. So he had a true human nature that could feel fright and pain and sorrow and this revulsion towards the idea of suffering so much. Above all, we think of our Lord and we think of his sacred heart. His sacred heart overflowing with love for us. And it's beautiful in our statues and pictures where we see that image of the Sacred Heart. And it is interesting that devotion to the Sacred Heart was virtually unknown for the first 15 to 1600 years of the Church's existence. It was only in the 1670s when our Lord appeared to St. Margaret Mary in France that the devotion to the Sacred Heart began to grow and to spread. Before that time, it was observed only by a few individuals. And one zealous French priest, St. John Eudes, in his religious order in France, in the earlier part of that 17th century. And so it is as though the devotion to the Sacred Heart has been saved for the latter times. And so what does that devotion mean? tell us. It tells us that the, that the heart of our Lord is overflowing with love for men. Even though we have offended him, yet he loves us. And we look at the image of the heart, and there's a flame coming out of the top to signify the ardent love of our Lord for men. In the midst of that flame, there is a cross that shows us that his love was so great that it led him to willingly embrace the cross and die upon the cross for our salvation. The heart is circled with thorns. 
and there is a gash in the side of the heart, reminding us of the piercing of the sacred heart by the centurion after our Lord died. But all of these symbols remind us of the love of our Lord. It is a wonderful devotion to pray to the sacred heart of Jesus, to reflect upon this heart. As our Lord said to St. Margaret Mary, this heart which has loved men so much, but is so little loved in return. So it's very important for us to have this devotion to the sacred heart of Jesus, to reflect upon his sacred heart. There are some beautiful ejaculations you can use such as Sacred Heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. We say that after Mass three times, after a low Mass, at the conclusion of those prayers at the foot of the altar, most Sacred Heart of Jesus, have mercy on us, etc., three times. Another beautiful ejaculation is, Sacred Heart of Jesus, I place my trust in Thee, which remind us, reminds us of the trust that we must have that we ought to have in our Lord's goodness and love for us, and many others, and many prayers. But to properly understand our Lord, the sacred heart, and the qualities or ideas that devotion to the sacred heart brings out to us, such as our Lord's love for us, his mercy, his forgiveness, his willingness to forgive, and his tremendous love for us, that's just part of the concept of our Lord and who he is. So again, this gets back to the first question, who is Jesus Christ? He not only is our Redeemer, he not only came into this world and assumed a human nature in order to suffer and die for us, he not only loves us beyond our ability to comprehend, so much so that St. Paul tells us our Lord would have died for each of us. So great is his love. But also, Jesus Christ is our future judge. And we must never forget that. Because if we do forget it, then we don't have a proper concept of our Lord. And this is true with many teachings of our faith, is that there is a balance. Or you might say there are two opposite poles. And a proper understanding of the truth of the faith is between them, or rather including both of those uh, seemingly opposing aspects. And what do I mean by that? That we think of our Lord, his love and forgiveness and goodness, but we must not forget that he will be our judge. Because if we forget that, we end up with an incomplete, imperfect, and even a false concept of our Lord. And it seems to me that that is exactly what happened at the time of Vatican II in the 1960s. Now those of us who were alive at that time remember the sermons began to be only about our Lord's love and goodness and mercy and joy and so on and so forth. There was such an overemphasis on mercy and forgiveness and goodness, the goodness of our Lord, there was a complete neglect of the whole concept of our Lord's judgment of mankind, that he is our judge. What do we say in the Apostles' Creed every day? We speak about our Lord who was crucified, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. The third day he rose again from the dead, sitteth at the right hand of the Father. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. That he will come to judge all men. And we recall the words of our Lord when during his passion he was dragged before the Sanhedrin. Now, the Sanhedrin was this council of 70 elders that would deal with religious questions among the people and a sort of tribunal for judging cases dealing with the Jewish religion and so forth. So after our Lord was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane by Judas and the band of soldiers that he brought, 
our Lord was dragged to the house of Caiaphas, the high priest. And that is where this assembly gathered. Caiaphas lived in a large house, a palace more or less, that had a large room where the Sanhedrin would convene. And according to the evangelists, our Lord is brought there and there were these different witnesses and they were contradicting one another. So finally Caiaphas stood up himself and said to our Lord, he said, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us if thou art truly the Christ, the Son of God. And the word Christ is a Greek word meaning the anointed one. In other words, it clearly was asking our Lord, are you the Messiah? Now he knew that our Lord would not deny it. And there was nothing else they could come up with to condemn our Lord. And so he demanded in his office as high priest, invoking the name of Almighty God, that our Lord tell the assembly, if he truly was Christ, the Son of God. And of course, our Lord knew very well that this would be what they would use to condemn him, even though with Pilate they would come up with other excuses, like he stirs up the people and he tries to replace Caesar and all of that. But our Lord said, Thou hast said it, I am. And, and this is the important part, and henceforth you shall see the Son of Man. And that's how our Lord often described himself, the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with great power and majesty. So it was a warning to all of those men seated there who were about to vote to condemn him to death. It was a warning that one day he would come not in weakness as they now saw him, he would come seated on the clouds of heaven with great power and majesty to judge all mankind. And so they better think carefully about what they were about to do. And so that is just one of many quotes that indicate that our Lord is not only merciful, we think of his sacred heart, mercy and forgiveness, he also is our just judge. And when that moment comes, which will be for each of us the moment of death, what we call the particular judgment, there will no longer be it will no longer be a time for mercy. It will be a time for strict justice. And the sentence will be passed. And then at the end of the world, in the general judgment, that sentence passed upon each of us will be publicized before all mankind, all those that have ever lived or ever shall live. And so our Lord will be the judge. And again, that's what we need to remember if we want to have a proper understanding of who our Lord is. Now, those of you who read The Reign of Mary, which is our magazine for the religious congregation, and you probably know that's one of my jobs to edit and publish The Reign of Mary. So last issue, which was I think in December, I made a few comments about something going on in the conciliar church, the Vatican II church, the Novus Ordo church, whatever you want to call it, the modern so-called Catholic church. And most of us here in this church have been traditional Catholics for so long, you left the Novus Ordo church probably many years ago, if you were ever there. The younger generations probably completely raised as, as pre-Vatican II traditional Catholics. So, as a result, we tend to not even become involved in what's going on in the Novus Ordo Church, the conciliar church. But this is a significant fact or occurrence that I wanted to comment on. And what happened was back in August, the end of August, there was a bishop, Archbishop Carlo Maria Viganò, who had been the apostolic delegate to the United States from the Vatican uh, for about five or six years in the early 2000s, maybe 10, 15 years ago. And he's now retired. At any rate, he came out with a public letter to the so-called Pope, Francis, 
criticizing him and blaming him for the problems of the pedophilia and the terrible clerical abuse that is going on or has been going on in the Novus Ordo Church. And in particular, he was citing the example of the infamous Archbishop Theodore McCarrick, former bishop or cardinal of um, Washington, D.C., who is one of those, and he was recently defrocked. But at any rate, he said to Francis, he said, I warned you shortly after you were elected that he was a bad character and some restrictions had been put on him and you moved the re removed the restrictions. And of course, Francis pretended like he didn't know anything about that. So this man, this Archbishop Bigano, wrote this public letter. And then he followed it up with another one. And then there was a third one in October. And that is the one that I quoted from. And I want to read to you a couple sections of his letter of October 19th. Quote, Pope Francis himself has either colluded in this corruption or, knowing what he does, is gravely negligent in failing to oppose it and uproot it. It is dismaying that amid all the scandals and indignation, so little thought should be given to those damaged by the sexual predations of those commissioned as ministers of the gospel. This is about souls." And he goes on to talk about the plague, as he calls it, of homosexuality among the clergy. And then this is the reason I quoted it, this next paragraph. This to me is the kernel right here. I want you to listen to what he says, and I'll comment on it. I am an old man who knows he must soon give an accounting to the judge for his actions and omissions. One who fears him who can cast both body and soul into hell, a judge who even in his infinite mercy will render to every person salvation or damnation according to what he has deserved. I believe that my continued silence would put many souls at risk and would certainly damn my own. Now, this is incredible because you do not hear that type of or read that type of language coming from the Novus Ordo Church. Years ago, they lost, abandoned, rejected hell, the concept of God's justice, and so forth. In fact, our priest, Father Michael Oswald, who has given several very interesting lectures at Fatima conferences over the last five years, made one comment about the belief in universal salvation. The idea that everybody ultimately gets to heaven. Even if you've done bad things, God is merciful, he's good, everyone will get to heaven. And I remember his, his uh, Father Oswald's terminology, he said, it is, the, it is the engine that drives the train. And he said, even though they all believe it, and you know they believe it by what they say, they won't come out and directly admit it, but most of them believe in universal salvation. So here is an outlier. Here is a supposed bishop. This Archbishop Vigano was ordained a priest validly in 1968, but consecrated under John Paul II in the New Rite, so he's not a valid bishop. But he thinks as a Catholic, and most of those in the Novus Ordo Church have long since abandoned Catholic thinking. And this is amazing to me. He says, I fear for the salvation of my soul. And I know if I did not take this step to publicly expose what I know is going on, I'll lose my soul. And again, it is so rare to find this anymore. But we as faithful Catholics should have the fear of the Lord. In fact, you know that in the Old Testament, it is stated that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fear is a good thing, a good thing, if it is not excessive and if it is based on true doctrine. And we all must have fear. Now, you know the old saying that to serve God out of love is better than to serve him out of fear. 
But as the imitation of Christ says, if we get rid of fear, then the love of God is not going to last very long. So we have those two pillars, those two motives that drive, that, that influence our way of thinking. The fear of God and his just punishments, but also the love of our Lord who loves us so much and deserves our love in return. So be very careful never to lose the fear of the Lord. Again, we read from Psalm 127, Blessed are all they that fear the Lord, that walk in his ways. And that's just one quote of thousands, especially from the Old Testament, about the value and the fear of the Lord. And how many souls there are that are faithful Catholics today. How many I have met over the years who began to change their lives, to amend their lives because of fear. Because they were afraid that if they did not change, they would be cast into hell. Now who would dare to say that's a bad thing? To have this true fear of the Lord, which actually, after all, is one of the gifts of the Holy Ghost, that leads one to change his life, to amend his life. I'm going to read a few sections from a meditation book on hell. And it says, it begins by quoting from the Athanasian Creed, one of the creeds that the church uses. Those who have done good deeds shall go into life everlasting. Those who have done evil into eternal fire, this is Catholic belief. But again, you wonder how many even believe that anymore in the Novus Ordo Church. Or if they do think there's a hell, it's only like for a mass murder or whatever. But we know that God is a just judge and that we shall have to render an account to him for every thought, word, and deed. And as our Lord said, we shall have to render an account even for an idle word. How much more so for deeds that are sins. So the author then here gives, goes on to give some um, quotations from scripture about hell. Isaiah, they shall be shut up there in prison. The book of Apocalypse, they shall be doomed to the great press of the wrath of God, to the bottomless pit, to the pool burning with fire and brimstone. Psalm 20, to an oven of fire. In St. Matthew, our Lord said, they shall be get condemned to exterior darkness where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And in the book of Job, from the Old Testament, it is referred to as a land of misery and darkness where the shadow of death and no order but everlasting horror dwelleth. So those are just a few of the quotations of Scripture referring to the place of torment that we call hell, where those are condemned who die in the state of mortal sin. St. John Chrysostom says, Think of hell, for the thought of hell must certainly keep you from going there. Those who never think of hell will probably end up going there. But if we meditate upon it, as the saints did, because it is real, then we shall have the fear of God that will motivate us to avoid offending him that we might not fall into that dreadful pit of suffering. In hell, there shall be the fire. St. Thomas Aquinas says, the fire in this world is like a refreshing breeze compared to the fire of hell. Because the fire of this world was made for the benefit of man, for heat and for cooking and so forth. Whereas the fire of hell is made for the purpose of punishing those deserving of punishment. Sight, hearing, smell, taste, touch will all experience pain and disgust in the maddening spectacle of that nauseating cesspool. And he goes on, the soul will also be harassed by the worm of conscience that will never die, but go on continually assailing the memory, the intellect, and the will. In other words, a person will think to himself, 
I am here because I misused my free will. I chose sin over God. And I am here because I deserve to be here. In God's perfect justice, this is one of the things. There, there will be no one in hell who will be saying, wait a minute, this isn't fair. I don't deserve to be here. The damned are compelled to acknowledge the justice of God's judgment and that they have deserved the severity of his punishments. So that is what we call the worm of conscience, that continual, that'll go on forever, that continual prodding of their conscience or guilt that they are there because of their own sins and they have no one to blame but themselves. And they will not only hate God, they will hate themselves and everyone else in hell, the demons and all the other damned souls. It is a place of frightful hatred and cursing and suffering. The lost soul will have to admit, I was wrong. It will have to meditate in despair on three points of eternal meditation. I have lost God. I have lost him entirely through my own fault. And I have lost him forever. Spasms of grief and paroxysms of despair will be inevitable. For the souls of the damned are that unhappy people whom the Lord is angry with. And no one can plumb the depths of God's wrath. As we read in Psalm 89, Who can know the power of thy anger? Will you not resolve to regulate well the appetites of your body and the faculties of your soul? Can you afford to be careless in the face of eternity? So that's just from a brief meditation book similar to so many other meditation books which treat of this reality of the just punishments of Almighty God. So I get back to our Lord. When we think of Jesus, and especially during Lent, we meditate upon our Lord's passion, his death on the cross, his infinite love for us. Let us also remember that he is and will be our future judge. And when we stand before our Lord to be judged, all of the goodness, all of the acts of mercy and kindness and benefits bestowed upon us will be a reminder that we have no excuse in offending our Lord. We can never say, I couldn't help but commit that sin. The temptation was too strong because God's grace will always be there. As our Lord said to St. Paul, and again, the epistle from a couple of weeks ago, my grace is sufficient for thee. God will always help us to conquer the temptation and to serve him faithfully. So reflect today in this day of recollection on the love, the goodness, the infinite mercy of our divine Lord, who loves us so much that he died for us, but also on his justice. And that justice will help us to have a wholesome fear of God and of his just punishments that we might so live that we will not end up suffering those everlasting punishments of hell. Please kneel now in reflection.